this series right here that we're starting today, I don't know that I've ever been more excited about a series because it's a series that I wish I could have heard when I was growing up. It's a series about the Holy Spirit that I think is so important to us creating. Because here's the deal. I think we all need to have a context and a parameter for experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit that makes us feel confident and safe to do so. Sometimes people preach about the Holy Spirit in a way that he seems intimidating and unapproachable. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is not unapproachable. He is somebody that is literally, Jesus said, he's your helper. He is our advocate. He's the paraclete is the Greek word. Like he wants to come along and things that are too hard for you. He wants to come help you accomplish that task. And so I'm really excited about this series. I have three goals for this series over the next few weeks. Number one, I want to take the stigma off of the Holy Spirit. I am tired of people thinking the Holy Spirit is the stepchild of the Trinity. He is of equal value of, as the Father and the Son. They are a triune Godhead that function in the same level of authority. They function in the same level of purpose. He is a good part of God, and you cannot say you love the Father and the Son and neglect the Holy Spirit. He is someone to be desired and to be welcomed. So I want to take the stigma off of the Holy Spirit. I want to make baptism in the Holy Spirit practical to you. I want you to understand that this is not something that is for the elite level Christians. This is not for the paid subscribers. And if you if you pay the ten dollar fee, you get to experience it. No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a free gift to believers. It is for every person in this room. It is for you. I know you're like, well, not me. No, you specifically you. If you thought not me, I'm, I'm pointing directly at you. I don't know who it was, but that's you. So I want to set a standard. This is the third thing. I want to set standards and create a template by which we can confidently dive into spirit-filled moments. Because the reason why we're apprehensive to step into spirit-filled moments is because we don't understand that Scripture has given us parameters that show us when it is and is not appropriate. And what is and is not appropriate. And over the course of this series, we're going to talk about that. I promise you by the end of these five weeks, no matter what your denominational theological background, you're going to get mad at me at least once in the next five weeks. All right. So today I'm just going to put you on notice. I did this last week and uh, we'll see what what the numbers are like. How many on here was raised Pentecostal? Anybody raised in Pentecostal church? All right. We got several folks, probably about 30, 40 percent of us. How many of y'all were raised thinking Pentecostal folks was crazy? All right. Some of y'all lying because you're like you're a little nervous. You're like, I don't want to hurt their feelings. But you thought you thought that was crazy. So I was raised uh, in in independent holiness, Pentecostal circles of, of church. And so we had a lot of crazy stuff happen in church. And we had a lot, honestly, we had a lot of fun in church. Like it got crazy up in there. We had all the ladies didn't cut their hair. And so they all wore it up really high, like the beehive thing. And they start feel the Holy Ghost and they start shaking their heads and bobby pins start flying out. And uh, it was that was like a real thing. That's not exaggerative. And so it was always somebody running around the aisles, somebody dancing, somebody falling out in the Holy Ghost. Like all that was what I grew up in. And so I love Pentecostal worship. I love spirit filled worship. And so that's why I want us to jump into this series and create a context that it, it's safe to enter into that type of environment, because some of those environments started in the right place but went to an unhealthy place because they didn't have parameters. They didn't understand what Scripture was saying. And so to jump into this series, I want to kind of let you know where it all started. I want to set the stage for you because it was a mild-weathered spring morning, roughly six or seven weeks after a culture-shaping trial had taken place in the middle of the night. They had captured this man that was being said to be an insurrectionist, was being said to be a heretic, and they had brought him before a makeshift trial, and they had condemned him to death by a Roman means of crucifixion for a Jewish crime of heresy. It was something that was unheard of. It was something that was actually illegal, but it had taken place nonetheless. And there had been a very public crucifixion of this Jewish rabbi named Jesus. Everybody had heard and seen this moment, but rumors had been circulating since three days after that. People had been saying, you know that Jewish rabbi they killed? He ain't dead no more. He got out of the tomb. 
and it began circulating. Over 500 people had eyewitness accounts of Jesus up and walking around doing miracles and teaching on the kingdom of God. 500 people had seen him, and of that 500, there was a contingency of people that had gone back from the mountain that they saw him ascend into heaven to the city of Jerusalem to go into an upper chamber because Jesus had told them, go and wait at Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. They had been given this task, and so 120 believers had gone into an upper chamber and began a prayer meeting seeking after the promise that Jesus had given them. For 10 days, they prayed and sought and wondered, what is this going to be like? The only context they had was, you're about to get some power. You're getting filled with power. Jesus didn't give them a theological understanding of what to expect. He didn't tell them the words to say. He said, go wait and be filled. That was it. And so for 10 days, they prayed, and they waited, and they prayed, and they waited. Until every Pentecostal knows, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered in one place and in one accord, when suddenly there came a sound. you got to say that suddenly, real abruptly like that. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven like as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, the backstory of this is that the reason we call it the day of Pentecost was because it took place during the Feast of Pentecost. And so there were people from all over the world that were gathered in the city of Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Well, when the Holy Spirit came and it was this sound of a windstorm and people speaking in all these different languages and cloven tongues like as a fire appeared on their head, it caught the attention of people outside of the room. And so people started to gather around this upper chamber where they heard a plethora of languages and they heard what sounded like a windstorm and they saw what looked to be fire and they thought, what in the world is going on to such a degree that they said, I think they're drunk. And so Peter came out on the porch with 11 other disciples and he said, these are not drunk as you think they are. But here's the verse that we're going to read. This is kind of the foundation for what we're preaching by the next few weeks. Acts chapter 2, verse number 16. This, it, this is the King James Version as well, so it's, it's more anointed and more spiritual. So you can go home knowing you actually read the Bible today. Acts chapter 2, verse number 16. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Peter has led up to this moment by saying they're not drunk, but this is actually something that hundreds of years ago a prophet named Joel preached about this exact instance, this moment in history. And this is what he said. He said, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. There are a couple of things that I'm not preaching about today, but there's a, a significant statement in this prophecy of Joel in the context and the culture that they were, because in Jewish culture, they did not value women and they did not value children. But when Joel was prophesying about who God was going to use, he said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, which was going against the cultural norm. And he said, your young men and your children. It was children and young men that God was saying, this is the evidence that the power of the Holy Spirit is here. In other words, no matter what culture has said about you, God says, I'm going to use every single person, no matter their age, no matter their gender, no matter who they are, they are a part of my plan to accomplish my will on the earth. That's for free. That ain't a part of our series today. All right. So Peter gets filled with the Holy Spirit, steps out on the porch, says they're not drunk, this is the prophecy of Joel, begins to preach the first ever spirit-filled gospel message. Begins to preach about the fact that Jesus was the Son of God, they killed him, he rose again. It's such a powerful message that 3,000 people get saved in this instance. All of a sudden, this group of 120 turns into 3,120 in one day. I don't know if they had a party with the pastors after, but they definitely should have. If they didn't, they needed a process right then to give you a plug in the servant on the team. 3,120. Since that moment, the movement has progressed. It has withstood persecution. It has withstood emperors that said, I'm going to destroy it. It has withstood heresies that have said, we are going to taint it. It has withstood progressivism that has said, it doesn't apply. Can I tell you, regardless of what culture may say, the church of Jesus Christ is still alive and active. People are still being saved. Bondage is still being broken. The Holy Spirit is still moving in the earth. And the truth of God's word is still the truth of God's word, no matter what culture tells us needs to be truth. No matter how much they tell us that it can't be right, the truth of God's word is still right. The church is still alive. The message is still 
the same. That 120 turns into 3,120, and it has progressed to now. It is believed that alive on the earth right now, there are 2.7 billion adherents to Christian theology. 2.7 billion people that profess Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. Now, here's the truth. Because there are 2.7 and 2.7 billion of us, there are about 2.698 billion opinions about how we ought to do church. Because just in the United States of America, that 2.7 billion people is represented by over 200 various denominations. Denominations is just, this is how we think we ought to do church. This is how we think we ought to read the Bible. This is how we think we ought to walk with Jesus. Worldwide, there are over 45,000 denominations. 45,000 approaches to the way that we do church. And one of the fastest growing movements within that denominational diversity is what's called the charismatic movement. You've probably heard of the charismatic movement. Uh, back in the day, it would have been called Pentecostal. It's been called Spirit-filled. But charismatic is drawing from, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul speaks of the gifts of the Spirit or spiritual gifts, the word that he uses, the Greek word, is charisma, which is the marrying of two words, charis, which means grace, ma means gifts. So it's gifts of grace or gifts of the Holy Spirit. Charismatic simply means I am a person that believes in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. So it's a tying to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, what are the gifts of the Spirit? I'm so glad you asked. It's very convenient because that's what I'm about to read to you. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 says this. Now concerning spiritual gifts or charisma, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Every individual, this is, this again, is not where I'm going today. But every individual gift of the Spirit that's given to your life is not just for your life. The gifts of the Spirit are given for the purpose of profiting all of us. And the problem is when we start to use the gift of the Spirit for our own personal profit at the detriment of the entire body of Christ, that's how false doctrines, that's how false representations of who the Spirit is takes place because we're not understanding that it is the individual gift is meant for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all all these things, distributing to, say that phrase with me, to each one. To each one. That means that you are intended to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Every believer is offered the opportunity to receive the gifts of the Spirit. Well, Pastor Ty, I wasn't raised that way. Each one. Every believer. Now, I need to let you know, I told you I'm going to make everybody mad before this series is over. Today, if you're Pentecostal or you're raised Pentecostal, you're probably who's going to get mad today. Because I got mad at me t while I was studying. So I got, I was, you know, while I was building the sermon, I got mad at myself. you probably going to be the ones that get mad at me today. But before I get into what I'm talking about, I need to let you know that I celebrate and encourage the gifts of the Spirit. We need the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. If you're not praying in tongues in your personal life, you're doing it wrong. Because it is the cheat code to your walk with Jesus. If you've never experienced a word of prophecy, you ain't living yet. I'm telling you, if you never had somebody read your mail with a word of knowledge, you're like, how'd, how'd, you, how'd you know that? Because that's how the Holy Spirit works. I, I encourage the gifts of the Spirit. But let me tell you something that has happened. One of the terms that we use for charismatic churches, remember, charismatic meaning those that operate in the gifts of the Spirit, is we call them, and I'd even refer to our house as a Spirit-filled church. Why is that problematic? Walk with me logically for just a minute. Because we're saying if a church operates in the gifts of the Spirit, that church is therefore filled with the Spirit. The consequent logical arrival from that is that if a believer operates in the gifts of the Spirit, the believer is filled. The problem is Acts chapter 2 tells us that, put that verse back up, Acts chapter 2, verse number 2, I think. Uh, go back. I, I didn't give you guys this. Acts chapter 2, you can look in your own Bible. Acts chapter 2, verse number 2. It says that they were all filled 
and began to speak. It doesn't say that they began to speak with other tongues and so they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Because the gift does not make you full of something. Being full of something makes you operate in the gift. And the problem is in charismatic churches, we have a lot of people that are saying, I'm full of the Spirit because I'm operating in the gift. And they're speaking in tongues and talking like the devil. They're prophesying and then gossiping. They're getting a word of knowledge, but then treating people like they're trash. Because you can fake a gift. You can operate and present yourself as having a gift and not be full of the one that you're supposed to be representing when you're operating in that gift. And I'm just going to tell you what my heart behind this series is. I do not want to be a church, a pastor, or Christ followers that speak in tongues and then don't walk in the nature of the spirit we're supposed to be full of. I, I, I'm This whole Pentecostal movement, I talked about this later in the sermon in first service, but the whole Pentecostal movement was born from this place that I just, if you study history, this, some people don't like this part of history, but there was a man named Charles Parham that traveled the world preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the early 1900s. Topeka, Kansas was one of the biggest moves, revivals. Well, in the process of him traveling the world preaching about the Holy Spirit, he began to do classes on being baptized with the Holy Spirit. At one of these classes, a man named William Seymour showed up to step into the class, walked into the room where Charles Parham was teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Charles Parham looked at William Seymour, who was a black man, and said, you got to get out of here because there ain't no black people allowed in this class. So William Seymour walked out of the room and stood at the door as Charles Parham taught on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He didn't get mad. He didn't get offended. He didn't necessarily like what was happening, but he said, I don't necessarily like that man, but the spirit that he's talking about, I want that. And so William Seymour prayed and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He went back to Los Angeles, California, and started preaching in the living room and on the porch of a lady on Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California. And thousands of people began to come and get saved and baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Pentecostal movement that swept across the nation and the charismatic movement that swept across the world started from the black man that wasn't allowed in the room that the white man was teaching on the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling Telling you, I, why do I tell you all that? Because Charles Parham was supposed to be full of the Spirit, but he was not producing the love that the Spirit was supposed to produce in his life. And I'm tired of being a church full of Bible believing Christians that don't act like we love nobody. We can speak in tongues all we want to, but Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if I speak in the tongues of angels and of men and have not love, I am as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. It don't, make no, it don't make no sense for me to speak in tongues and not love the world around me. And so we are not satisfied to simply have the gifts in operation. We got to be full of the one that's giving the gifts in the first place. We got to carry the nature of the one that's carrying the gifts. I got to hurry. I took way too long on that. So how can we know that we're full of the Spirit? There's a, a, a large portion of debate around Christendom, in specific those that still believe in the operation of the gifts, as to how you can know you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. There's something called the Initial Physical Evidence Doctrine, or IPE Doctrine, that says that tongues, or speaking in tongues, is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That belief is drawn from the fact that all throughout Acts, when they began to be filled with the Spirit, they began to speak with other tongues. And so we say, I, I mean, I grew up that when you went to pray to get filled with the Holy Ghost, you would stand there and some sweet old lady would come up behind, come up to you while you're praying and start hitting your chin so you start speaking in tongues because that's what you needed. You just, it was like a, like, a, like a motor, you know, you just need a little jump start to get you rolling. You got one guy on one, high, one, guy on one side saying let go, another one saying hold on, and you're like, I don't. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So you just start gibbering at some point so they'll leave you alone and you can fall out and just be done. I mean, it's, they were praying, if you'd start speaking in tongues, that means you're full of the Spirit. The problem with that is that when Jesus was telling us how you're going to know if somebody's a part of the club or not, when Jesus was telling us how you're going to know if they're on the same team or not, he didn't say you'll know them by the tongues. He didn't say you'll know them by prophecy. 
He didn't say you'll know them by a word of knowledge. But in Matthew chapter 7, he said, beware of false prophets. What's a gift of the Spirit? Prophecy. Beware of false gift possessors who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there is ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Today I'm preaching to you about the Holy Spirit, and this is the title of my message. The Holy Spirit is not just gifts. He is not just gifts. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Here's the big idea. If you take it notes, write this down. The Holy Spirit is not only a giver of gifts, he is also a producer of fruit. I'm thankful for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he wants to produce fruit in our life. In the very beginning of creation, Genesis chapter 1, we are given a peek into the nature of God. He shows us who he is in the way that he sets creation up. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields, look at that word, seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose, again, there it is, seed, is in itself on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth grass, the earth that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. When God was creating the vegetation and the nutritional system of the earth, he did not create enough food to last all eternity at the beginning of creation. He created plants with seed, and fruits with seed. And then in Genesis chapter 2, look what he said. It said that, let me find this verse. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15. Then the Lord took the man, put him in the garden to tend and to keep. You know what that means? It means he put him there to cultivate. So God created seed, and then he created man to cultivate the seed. He gave man everything that he would need to potentially provide all the needs for all humankind for all of eternity. But it would go unused if man did not cultivate the seed that was in the fruit. If they wanted more fruit, they had to plant more seed. Now, how crazy would it have been if Adam and Eve had gone to the garden and God said, I want you to tend and keep. I want you to cultivate, be fruitful, multiply. I want you to grow this thing. If they had grabbed the seed and held it up and said, we did it, celebrated the seed, that makes no sense. Because the seed, nobody gets hungry and says, you know what I need? Like, I'm hungry. I need some seeds. No, when you're hungry, you need the fruit of the seed. When you need nutrients, you don't need seeds, you need plants. But you don't get plants if you don't plant seeds. I submit to you today that as valuable and powerful as the gifts of the Spirit are, the gifts of the Spirit are the seeds of the Spirit. He intends for us to take the seed and sow the seed of the gifts for the purpose of producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. But many of us experience the gifts of the Spirit and begin to celebrate the miracle of the seed and as such never produce the product of the fruit. Because we are not utilizing what God has given for the purposes that he intends for it to be utilized. The Spirit of God is intended to produce fruit in our lives. How often have I received the gift, the seed of the gifts of the Spirit and been satisfied to simply celebrate the fact that I got some seeds? And man, when we get a good seed, we tell everybody, look at, this, look at this seed that I got. I can prophesy. I gave a prophetic word, and it was right. I spoke in tongues. I gave, I gave a message in tongues. We celebrate. We wear them like a badge of honor. But the seeds are meant to be planted, not celebrated. We welcome them. We want them. But they are not standalone products within themselves. They are meant to produce something. We receive the gifts of the Spirit in our services and slap on the title of Spirit-filled. But operating in the gifts is not necessarily being Spirit-filled. The true testament of being Spirit-filled is being Spirit-developed. See, I can walk in a gift of the Spirit 
and operate in a gift of the Spirit and not really change all that much. But I ain't producing the fruit of the Spirit unless I'm letting him do a work in me. And there's a whole lot of people and a whole lot of churches that are full of gifts and barren of fruit. May it not be said of this house. May it not be said of my life. I'm thankful for the gifts, but they are the seeds. The seeds are intended to equip us for the cultivation of our lives. When I receive a word of prophecy, it's to give me steps to take in order to tend and to keep the garden of my soul. When I receive the gift of tongues, it's for the purpose of praying. Where Joel said, or uh, Jude said it like this. He said that when I pray in the Spirit, I'm building myself up in the most holy faith. What does that mean? It means I'm cultivating something out of me. I'm growing fruit out of me as I pray in the Spirit because the gift is a seed that I'm supposed to plant and cultivate. So when I receive the gift of tongues, it's for the purpose of praying the, what I don't know to pray, and I tend to grow a garden in my soul, to tend and to keep the garden of my soul. The gifts are seeds that I am to plant in order to bring about the harvest of fruit. Here's the big idea. The release of the gifts is an act of providence. But the continued development of the fruits is a manifestation of partnership. Because here's, here's the awesome thing about this, is God begins this process just like he did in Genesis. He gives us the seed. He gives us the gifts. You and I cannot cultivate the authentic gifts of the Spirit in and of ourselves, no matter what we do. They are a gift of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit will not be produced in our lives without us partnering with the Spirit. We have responsibility in this equation. There, and therein lies the statement that causes many churches and Christ followers to back away from this because it's the word responsibility. We like to believe that it's all on God to make anything happen. And there's some stuff that only God can do, but God will not do what I can. God will not break chains in my life that I am not willing to put discipline in place to protect me from. We're coming and praying for deliverance from the same thing 43 times and not changing any patterns in our life. You cannot self-discipline yourself to freedom, but don't you dare receive freedom and not put discipline in place to protect it. Because when God sets you free, we have responsibility to carry that. That's part of producing fruit. It's understanding that I have a responsibility of cultivation. I'm not saying we can produce the spirit on our own, but there's, but there's nothing that a farmer can do to create the seed, but also the seed will always be the seed unless the farmer plants it. If we want to produce the fruit, we have to plant the seed. i got to hurry. I'm almost done. Interestingly enough, having a mentality that is focused on producing the fruit creates a filter for how to handle the seed. Because... I told you Galatians chapter 5 gave you this whole list of things that we're supposed to possess. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering. I, got, I misquoted it, and I'm now I'm lost. So Galatians chapter 5 gives you all the fruit of the Spirit. You can read it. That's your homework. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us all the gifts of the Spirit, which is the seed of the Spirit. If you're, if you're looking at, you know, if you talk to business coaches, organizational coaches, whatever, they tell you to imagine where you want to be in five years, ten years, whatever, level you want to go to, and then reverse engineer that place to figure out what you need to do today. And so understanding Galatians chapter 5 is the ultimate goal of the Holy Spirit for your life. He wants you to be a person that possesses love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. He wants you to possess those things. So our job as Christ followers is to reverse engineer a life that is full of those things all the way back to the carrier of the seed or the gifts of the Spirit and ask, how do I take this gift and sow it in such a way that it's going to produce this fruit? When I have that understanding, I can know that the gift will never contradict the fruit. The gift will never be a barrier to what the fruit wants to accomplish in my life. And that creates a filter by which we can operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Because I grew up in a church where, not necessarily my family, but there would be people that are preaching, and they would feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit, air quotes, or in Kentucky it was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
That was supposed to be funny. Only like three people laughed. It's okay. They, w- they would feel the Spirit, and they would begin to preach under the anointing. And I don't know any other word to say it, but it was just me. Well, the gift is not going to manifest in a way that contradicts the fruit. And so if I'm mean-spirited, it's an indication that ain't a gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit produces love. People preach stuff, and, and it's amazing. There was a guy a couple years ago that had a prophetic dream. And he recorded a video on YouTube. Never had. He said, I've never had a prophetic dream before, but I had this dream. And put it on YouTube, and like 300,000 people watched it in like two days. It was crazy. It went viral. Well, wouldn't you know it, the next week he had another prophetic dream? Never had prophetic dreams before, but now he has an Instagram follow or a, a YouTube following about 200,000 subscribers that are waiting on the next prophetic dream. And all of them were about doom and gloom and it's going to be terrible. And you better, I'm, I can't tell you how many times I went to Walmart because there was about to be a shortage of milk during COVID. Anybody else go buy every grocery and then the shortage, the FBI never shut it down. It never, I'm the only one. Okay, that's fine. I'm a conspiracy theorist, I guess. We went and we went and toilet paper was real. That was a struggle. That was a struggle bus was real. That was a struggle. But as they began to say, I'm prophesying, it was always fear inspiring. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. And so, how am I going to tell you that I'm operating in the gifts of the Spirit and sowing fear into your life? I'm not saying that we never talk about things, and there needs to be a healthy fear of the Lord. But if all I'm doing is saying the world's going to crumble, the world's going to fall, this government is going to fall, this is gonna, if that's all I'm doing and I'm never pointing somehow that back to the finished work of Jesus, prophecy is to point to Jesus. The gifts of the Spirit are to point to Jesus. Everything the Spirit does is about Jesus. The, the gifts should not contradict the fruit. Now, you might have said amen up until now, but this is where I'm going to lose all my Pentecostal folks right here. I want you to go to that second, the last verse in Galatians chapter 5. As we look at the gifts of the Spirit, or the fruits of the Spirit, gentleness and self-control. I can't tell you how much I wish that was not listed in those fruits. Because, again... I've been in settings where the spirit was moving and people started doing some straight up crazy stuff. We used to go to this one church. My brother used to preach there. My brother started preaching when he was 13 years old. And so we went to all kinds of places because anywhere that would let a 13 year old preach, that's where we went. So we went to this one church and every single time we went there, this lady would get a word and she'd say, they, ha- they literally had a stack of, like, wash tubs up by, the pu- up by the pulpit because she always got a word involving wash tubs somehow. It was she would get a word. She'd say, everybody needs to take off their left shoe and put it in the wash tub and pass their shoe to the person to their right. And, like, it was always this crazy, weird, like, Twilight Zone stuff. And everybody would, would do the – I've been in service that people get the, the weird gyration thing and, and like, trances, and, I, and I, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm not here to, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm telling you parameters that we're going to walk in. Because if I believe that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, every time you ask somebody in those, in those contexts, well, why'd you do that? Well, I, I just couldn't help it. So you're telling me there was a gift of the Spirit that manifested in such a way that contradicted the fruit of the Spirit. The, the, the gift of the Spirit manifested in such a way that you lost control when the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. When you walk with an awareness that the fruits are the goal, it creates a filter and a parameter with which to operate in the gifts. Because the gifts will never contradict the fruit. And so here is the goal of this house. The responsibility of the Spirit-filled church is to relinquish control while maintaining order. It's not that we got to control everything, but we will walk in order. Because God is a God of order. 
Every tragedy in the history of humanity is the result of somebody getting out of God's order. Every situation, the reason that sin is a part of our society is because all the way back in the garden, Adam and Eve got out of order. And so we're not saying, when we say we're spirit-filled and spirit-led, we're saying if the Holy Spirit wants to move in the middle of the second song, when we got a third song to get to, that's fine. But even in the midst of us relinquishing control, we will maintain order. Because you can be in a spirit-filled environment and it not become chaos and confusion. And therein is the calling of the church. We will relinquish control while maintaining order. I believe with all of my heart that the gifts of the Spirit are necessary and that we need to seek after them and we welcome them. But more than we need the gifts, we need to produce the fruits. And the only way to produce the fruits is to walk in relationship with the giver of the gifts. I, I really hope, I, I told you at the beginning, one of my goals is to make the Holy Spirit practical. And I think a lot of people are really hesitant to the baptism in the Holy Spirit because to some degree they do carry the belief that I told you, that the way that I know I'm filled with the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues. And so I know people that have sought after the baptism of the Holy Spirit for like a decade because I, don't, I think they had this mentality that like when they got to a certain point in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit was just going to like grab their tongue and start making them speak in tongues. It's self-control. The Holy Spirit is not going to force you to do anything. In fact, in the book of Acts, when it said that they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, the Greek word for utterance is actually a word that, was, that points back to theatrical productions to where there was a stagehand on the side of the stage that when you forgot your line, the stagehand would yell it to you and then you would say it. So when the Spirit gave them utterance, it wasn't that the Spirit was speaking through them. He was speaking to them and saying, you can say this. And so they began to speak in a heavenly language as the Spirit gave them the words to say. But they were the ones that said the words. And so maybe you've been hesitant to, to speak in tongues. or You've been hesitant to walk in the gifts of the Spirit because you're like, I, I've never lost control. And I'm here to tell you, you're not going to. It's a surrender. It's a partnership. It's saying, God, you're putting this phrase in my mind. And so I'm going to say it. And as I say that phrase, he puts another one in my mind. And I say that one, and he puts another one. And all before I know it, I've now developed a heavenly language. And so now when I go into my prayer closet, I don't got to say, Lord, would you give me, would you pray, give me the words to pray? He's, he's given me a prayer language. And so now when I start to feel the attack of the enemy, and I start to feel depression and anxiety and fear, I can, I can speak against it in the name of Jesus. And it works, and I pray in English. But there are some times that I just got to let something on the inside of me pray through me. And I begin to pray in words and utterances and groanings that I don't even understand, but it's heaven, spirit, communing with spirit, and God begins to do something. And I'm going to tell you the greatest part about praying in tongues. This is why I, I just believe, I, I know that uh, the, the, the scripture said that he gives to some this and to some that and to some this, and it's, it was individual. I just personally believe that God, would, would be willing for everybody to have the gift of tongues. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that. Because it is the cheat code to your walk with Jesus. Because when I pray in tongues, the enemy doesn't know how to subvert my prayers. Because he doesn't speak the heavenly language. And so when I start praying, Lord, would you move in my finances, the enemy knows, all right, I'm going to go with his finances because that's what he's focused on. When I start praying, Lord, would you move in my health? The enemy starts saying, can I move in his health? But when I start praying in the spirit, all of hell is like, I don't even know. I don't know what we need to do right now. I don't know how to attack this guy. It's a cheat code. You start praying in the spirit, and I'm telling you, it is as simple. How do I receive the Holy Spirit, Pastor? The same way you receive Jesus, by faith. When you receive Jesus, all you did was said, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. And I'm sorry for the way I've been living my life. Would you come into my heart and change me? And we believe he does. The same pattern applies to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I believe you are the third person of the Trinity. 
And I believe that you are good. And I believe you're for me. So would you come into my life? And whatever gifts you bring with you, I'm here for it. And as you begin to pray that prayer, I'm just telling you the Holy Spirit is going to fill your life. But don't be satisfied to just operate in a gift and think that's the end of the process. Because he's not just gifts. He wants to produce fruit. I want you to stand with me today.